G'day guys and welcome to Redriven. Now, imagine if you found out that Leonardo DiCaprio was a competitive downhill mountain biker. That'd be awesome, yeah? Finding out that this suave and sophisticated and immensely respected actor has an extreme sports side. Well, that's pretty much this car, the Lexus ISF, a suave, sophisticated and immensely respected car that with its five litre V8 under the bonnet has a bit of an extreme sports side. These things were heavily praised when new, but what about now? What about now that they're not new? What about now that they've got a few thousand Ks, a few years under the belt? Are they any good? Are they reliable? What do they like to live with every day? And most importantly, should you buy one? Let's find out. Now, before we get deep into the Lexus ISF, can you please do us a favor and hit those like, subscribe, and bell icon buttons? And hey, why not go and follow us on all the socials as well? Now, in this video, we will be focusing on the Australian derivatives of the Lexus ISF from 08 to 2014. But if you're not from Australia, don't freak out because everything we're gonna be going over should relate to ISFs in your local market. And also, look, while we can't go into every graphic technical detail in this video for obvious reasons, we have done that and we've put it in our handy redriven cheat sheets. Our cheat sheets are invaluable as they provide a full breakdown of the car's model range, its common problems, what you need to look out for before you hand over your hard-earned cash, how much of that cash you should be handing over, and so much more. Check it out in the link below. Now the ISF project started way back in 2002 when a bunch of Lexus engineers got together to try to create something that could outdo the Germans at their best. From the outside, it is pretty easy to mistake an ISF for a more regular IS series, but that bulging bonnet houses a Yamaha engineered 5 litre V8, while a unique body kit continues the ISF's design aesthetics. Lightweight 19-inch alloy wheels complete the side profile, while a subtle boot lid spoiler and quad dual stack exhaust pipes define the rear end. Okay, looks wise, obviously it is subjective. Personally, I love the way these things look. Um, it's aging so gracefully, but it is aging. And what I mean by that, it's, it's somewhere in that weird position between it. It's not old enough yet to be like a classic, but it's not new enough to be all trend setting and cutting edge. I still think it looks pretty cool, but. Now, this particular ISF has been lowered. Personally, I think it's been lowered a bit too far. What do you think? Do you like how low this is? Let us know in the comments section below. As far as quality goes, like many headlights from this generation, they can get a little bit milky like this one, but they can be cleaned like this one. As far as paint quality goes, look, this thing does need a bit of a polish, but some quality car care products will bring this thing right up. Interesting, the rear spoiler, the weather has got to it, it has aged and it does need a bit of a respray. Um, as far as panel gaps go, unlike the Mercedes-Benz S-Class that we reviewed recently, the link is just up here, all these panel gaps are precise and perfect across the entire car. Good old Japanese quality. Okay, how's the interior? Well, as far as design goes, it's starting to feel its age. Again, it hasn't, it hasn't reached that, you know, it's a classic car look yet and it's not new enough to be all cutting engine design chic. I'm not so sure about this kind of champagne carbon fiber finish either. It's a bit, a bit overly blingy for my taste. What do you think? Do you like it? I think it's gross. Okay, as far as quality goes, look, this car's from 2008. It has got a stack of Ks on it, but everything feels great. All the, all the switch gear and buttons, it feels new. Even the leather, it's aging pretty well. This is a daily driver and like, yeah, it's getting a bit shiny, but it's pretty good. Again, some of the European brands could learn a thing or two about this Japanese uh, leather quality because it feels good, really good. One thing that's not so good is this digital clock. I'm pretty sure that's out of a Toyota Tarago from 1998, so that's a bit disappointing. But what's not disappointing, these seats, they are pretty much perfect. They're supportive and sporty, yet still comfortable. The seating position, spot on. Love the seats. Okay, the back seat. Look, I am crammed in here. This is in my driving position. I'm six foot two and my feet are squished under the seats. I'm forced to do, uh, again, an OnlyFans style leg spread and my knee is squished between the seat and the door. Also, my head's kind of hitting this C pillar. There's not a whole lot of room here. So how's the tech? Well, look, it's from 08. It's getting a bit old. It does have a touch screen that actually works really well. But the overall user experience is pretty clunky and old. That's to be expected. There's like heaps of duplicate buttons and it can get a little bit confusing. Apple CarPlay and Android Auto hadn't even been invented when this car came out, but there is still a decent amount of Bluetooth connectivity. But you do have to be patient with it because it's not all that fast to respond. 
Is it practical? Well, look, room in the boot, it's deep, okay? It goes deep, but this, this gap here is quite narrow, so I'm a, bit, I'm a bit squished in. So if you've got any large suitcases and you want to put something on top, yeah, it's okay. Kind of comfy, sort of. Hmm. As far as getting in the back seat, look, I know this is a performance car, but getting in the back's almost like getting in like a Lotus race car. Oh, God. Oh, bloody hell. Okay, practicality in the back seat is not great, but not too bad. You've got some matte pockets back here. You've got your own air vents. If you're disgusting and filthy, there's an ashtray. It does have an armrest with these cool slide out cup holders that kind of looks like something out of Star Wars. Look at that. And practicality up the front, you've got these kind of cool adjustable door bins. Um, it's BYO phone holder because there's nowhere to put your phone because this thing was made in the days before, you know, smartphones. So you've got this. Oh shit, whoops, whoops. Sorry. Uh, you've got an ashtray and cigarette lighter here if you're a disgusting, filthy human. You've got a little flip up lid for your cup holder here. And you've got this cool slidey, flippy, flippy, slidey center console tray here. Oh, and good size glove box. What goes wrong with them? Well, as I'm sure you know, Lexuses are basically just fancy schmancy Toyotas, and Toyotas have a fantastic reputation for reliability. But this is a performance car, and this engine was engineered by Yamaha, so maybe we go to a qualified mechanic to find out what goes wrong with them. That's not me, it's Jim. Lexus ISF, Toyota engineering and Yamaha tweaking. What a great combination. Although we don't see a lot of these in the workshop, we do know that a lot of them are driven pretty hard, they get taken to track days, so it's important to look at all those things. Brakes are gonna wear, tires are gonna wear, so have a good look at that if you're looking at them. And when it comes to specific ISF issues, there really aren't any. Just make sure it's got a good, solid service history. Look for signs of abuse, but besides that, it's a bloody good car. I mean, it's a V8 in a Lexus. How good is that? Is it safe? Well, look, it's not as safe as the majority of modern cars, and it is a powerful rear-wheel drive sedan, and it's relying on some pretty old technology to keep it straight and narrow on the road, so it's kind of safe. Multiple airbags, ABS, traction control, stability control, brake assist, and a five-star NCAP safety rating from way back in the day should keep you pretty safe and sound. So, what's it like to drive? Well, first up, the sound. Listen to this. There's just something about a naturally aspirated V8 that makes me weak at the knees, especially one that's made in Japan. Look, I know we're all supposed to be all romantic and gaga over muscle cars and, you know, Aussie V8s and, you know, the whole troop of European V8s are fantastic, but I don't know, it might just be me. A Japanese V8 just does it for me. It's like this perfect balance between, you know, old school muscle, but phenomenal technology and engineering. I just, I love a great Japanese V8. Driving around like a responsible adult, this thing's fantastic. Like the ride is quite firm and is a performance car, but it's not it's not harsh or crashy at all. Like we've hit some kind of decent sized potholes and it doesn't upset it in any way, shape or form. It's just compliant, bloody lovely. So the overall size and vision out of the ISF is spot on. Like it's a bit it's a bit smaller than some more modern performance sedans, and it's just it's easy to maneuver in and out of tight parking spots. As I said, the vision's great, it's easy to judge all the perimeters of the car. Pretty much perfect. So the gearbox. Look, when you're driving around like a normal adult, it's smooth and effortless. The problem is, if you wanna have a bit of fun, if you're in auto and you floor it, it takes an eternity to realize what's going on because the tech that runs the gearbox is pretty old. Here's an example, ready? Floored it. There we go. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit slow. The car's not slow. The gearbox is just a bit slow. As far as noises and sound goes, look, this car is from 2008. It's got 161,000 Ks on it. These are some rough roads, and there's hardly any rattles or squeaks. There is a little rattle from the back left, but it's, again, it's as tight as a drum in here. It feels great. And as far as other noises go, look, there's not a lot of wind noise. There's a little bit of road noise, but the real noise, this. <laughs> I love this. I love this thing. It's so good. 
So aside from the gearbox, the other problem is that this engine doesn't really wake up until it's over 3,800 revs. Underneath that, it almost feels like a old school turbo engine off boost. It's almost a bit laggy. Once it's over 3,800 RPM, fantastic. And the higher you get to that 7,000 RPM red line, it's just, it's delicious. It's fantastic. But yeah, you gotta gear change, gear change, gear change. Nothing, 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 nothing. Power. Now, personally, I think that's actually good for your license because it just gives you a couple of seconds to go, do I really want to do this? And you know what? Yeah, I want to do this. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. The steering and handling are fantastic. It's actually quite a nimble car to drive. But again, there's a technical problem here. Because the safety technology is also getting quite old, it really cuts in and destroys the fun quite quickly. So rather than, you know, like modern day ESC and traction control systems kind of guiding you through, basically going, it's okay, man, I've got your back, like you have some fun, but we'll keep you on the straight and narrow. It doesn't do that, it just goes, no, you're not gonna have fun. It just cuts all the power. It's just a bit of a killjoy. It's, it's very upsetting. So I know what you're thinking. You're just thinking, well, why don't you just turn all the safety systems off? Won't that help? Well, again, the problem is because this engine only really gets into its stride above 4,000 RPM, by the time you get there, you're deep into the old, oh, hello officer, yes, please take my license levels of speed. So therefore, the only place to really stretch this thing's legs is on a racetrack. And we can't afford a racetrack yet, but we might be able to with more subscribers. So just hit that, hit that subscribe button. So look, overall, the driving experience is excellent. It does the cruising thing so well and it is really engaging when you're properly up. But the problem is, when you want to have just like little snippets of fun, because the tech is a bit slow, it just, I don't know, just kind of, that delayed response is just a bit annoying. Pricing here in Australia starts in the low 40s for high kilometre pre-facelift slightly shabby condition ISFs and then tops out in the mid to high 60s for post-facelift low kilometre mint condition ISFs. Lexus have a claimed fuel consumption figure of 11.4 litres per 100 k's and that is hilarious. You're never going to see that. On this test we're seeing figures closer to 17. If you see 11.4 you must be dead inside. Lexus offered a four year, 100,000 kilometer warranty, which obviously all these are well and truly out of warranty by now. And servicing is recommended at every 15,000 Ks or 12 months. But we recommend getting these serviced way more than that because these are a highly tuned performance engine and yeah, you need to update those fluids pretty regularly. Keep this thing serviced regularly. If you are in the market for an ISF, make sure it has a thorough service history because if things start going wrong under here, the bills will add up pretty quickly. Also, budget in for some quality high performance tires because these things with seriously good rubber, beautiful. So should you buy one? Well look, chances are if you're in the market for one of these you're also looking at C63 AMGs and BMW M3s, yeah? Yep, I thought so. And look, both of those cars arguably are going to give you a better driving experience but with the fit, finish, and overall quality of the ISF, I think it tips the I think it tips the scales in favor of the Lexus. Find yourself an ISF with a solid service history and in mint condition, and you're gonna have yourself one hell of a car, and possibly even a future classic. Guys, thank you so much for watching, and what do you think of the ISF? Would you buy one? Let us know in the comments section below. And hey, while you're at it, make sure you hit those like, subscribe, and bell icon buttons, and hey, why not go and follow us on all the socials as well? See you next time.